we'll go ahead and get started here. I, I wrote a, uh, a small or a short list of concepts that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and again, we're continuing our talk about inheritance. Um, and the first one is overriding base class members. This is something that you're going to do pretty frequently if you're working with inheritance is you're going to want to write a more specific implementation of a method or maybe a property uh, in a child class. Okay, so kind of going back to yesterday, um, we had the animal class, and I'll put it over here on the left. And if we looked at our animal class, it had some fields. We wrote a property here. We wrote another property. And we wrote a method called move. And this method called move is generic. Generic move method. Um, and it's generic because we're writing, you know, we're implementing how a generic, you know, animal would move. And you, in, in reality, you would never, you would never create an object from this class. Because there's nothing that's just an animal. There's only more specific things, dogs, cats, alligators, whatever. Um, so you, you probably wouldn't even instantiate an animal class. You would only use it as a parent class. And so since it's so generic, it's got a generic move method, kind of coming back here, um, if I were to go ahead and create a dog and create a cat and if we remember both dog if I take a look at those classes cat extends animal and so does dog dog extends animal so we got our parent class a couple children classes and then pitbull extends dog so that's our kind of class hierarchy and if I went ahead and created these objects and I did a uh, council um, matter of fact we don't need to put it in a right line since it does the it does the right line in the method, so we don't need to wrap it around the right line. That's why it's barking at us here. If we tell our if we tell our cat to move and we tell our dog to move, you can see the output is they are somehow moving. Um, however, you know maybe your animals move a little bit differently. Right, so maybe dog and cat aren't the best example examples because they're probably going to move similarly, but um, maybe maybe there's a slight difference. And so um, to to set this up so that this method can be overridden in a child class, I'm going to go into the animal class. I'm going to go into the move method, and we're going to add a keyword uh, virtual. Okay, and what that really does is that sets this method up so that it can be overridden in a child class. Now, to override it in a child class, it needs to have the same... <coughs> to override a method in a child class, the method needs the same signature. Right, so it needs the same method name, it needs the same access modifier we know public void move no parameters so let's write that again public void move no parameters except for we have a different keyword here with the keyword override so since this is the dog is going to move, uh, we'll do a council dot right line uh, 
You just say something like the dog sprints. Don't forget your don't forget how to spell. The dog sprints. Okay? And if we were going to override that same method inside of cat. just lays there. So the cat doesn't really move too much, but the dog's going to sprint. Now we take a look at what we wrote before. And you can see we have written more specific implementations of the move method. So if you want to inherit, if you want to inherit um, the parent method and then you don't override it you can do that however many times not all the time many times you'll want to provide more specific implementations of a method or of a property and again the way to do that is to mark the parent method or property with virtual and then in the child class mark it with override Now I kind of hinted at this a little bit with accessing base class methods and properties from a derived class. I don't know, you, you might have seen that code. And I'm, I'll even go back and do this part over and show you this was actually already in here. So if, if you notice I said public override And then it gave me the move method. And when I hit enter on this, there was this base.move. So this is a method call. And what base does is it says call the parent version of this method. So in our example, you know, since cat, it wasn't building on top of what the animal was doing the animal was somehow moving what we did was we just completely overrid that method and did something completely different however if your parents method was still useful maybe it compounded right so the animal was somehow moving so you would call that and then in addition to that you would say oh wait it's a cat so never mind, it just lays there. So with the keyword base, okay, base.move is how we're going to access the parent version of this move method, even when we're overriding it. So you notice, uh, let's take a look at the output of that, right? So. So this is the cat class accessing the parent version of the method and then appending, oh wait, it's just a cat, so it just lays there. So when you override a method, you can still access the parent versions of that method if it's useful to you. And the benefit of that is you don't have to have the code in two different places. Again, in Animal, we write this right line and if that was important to the cat, right, we would copy this and just put it here. But then we would have that code in two different places, right? And if you had to change that code, you'd have to change it in two different places. Instead of doing that, just call that parent method with base. And you can reuse your code instead of, instead of, uh, having to rewrite it. So go back to the notes here. So accessing base class methods and properties from a derived class. 
uh, using the base keyword, i.e., for example, base.move. If it were a property, you know, um, it would be a little bit different. And the book has a demonstration of a property, but it might look something like base.name. Um, to call the the get the get block of the name property. Okay. Now moving on to implicit referenced conversion. So this is this is a little strange the first time you see it. So you definitely need to kind of pay attention here because this is definitely um, something you haven't seen. So what we can do is on the left side, okay, normally we say animal and we give it a name. And this is our kind of normal syntax for creating an object. Okay, but now that we have this inheritance thing going on, this can be written differently. And to kind of show you that, I can say animal A1 equals a new dog. And this actually compiles and it works. You might look at this going, well, what the heck is that doing? Well, at this point, and if you, if you kind of break this down, we've got a parent class on the left and the child class on the right. So that's kind of the first thing that, that helped me remember how this could even be done, right? The, the variable is on the left. The variable is named A1. And it currently references one of its children. It references a dog. And so if I just comment this out here, what we have up above, and if I were to say A1.move, and run it, you would see the dog sprints. You could then change your reference. You could then change A1, just to demonstrate this, I'll say animal A1, and I'll put a semicolon. And then here I'll say A1 dot, uh, A1 equals new dog, just like I had before, instead of putting it on one line, I put it on two. And then we move A1. Now I'm going to reassign A1 equals a new cat and A1.move. And as you might guess, the cat will just lay there. So let's run it. So this comes from the dog moving. Remember, this comes from the cat moving. These two lines come from that cat moving. Well, it just depends on which, so that it just depends on which object this variable is referencing. So when it references a dog, then it knows to call the move method from the dog class. If you then change that variable to reference a cat, then it knows to go to the move method of the cat class. So just this, what I just demonstrated has a fancy name. And this is one of those terms that I think we studied in chapter one. And that is polymorphism. And what polymorphism means is many, it, it's, uh, it's Latin, and it stands for many forms. And literally what it means is that, look at this line of code. This a1.move and this a1.move. The code looks exactly the same. But it takes on a different behavior based on the object that it references. 
it's like the book gives a really good example of this. Okay, the word play in English has polymorphic behavior. You can play a guitar and you can play a video game. And those actions are very different based on the object that you're referencing. If you play the guitar, the guitar is the object. Unless you're playing guitar hero. Don't do that to me. <laughs> <laughs> you said unless you're playing guitar hero. If you're playing a guitar, the object is the guitar. So your actions are with your hands and the guitar pick and the chords and everything like that. Whereas if you're playing a game, the object is the computer or the console, right? And your actions are picking up a controller or typing at the keyboard and clicking the mouse. Okay, so the actions have many forms, many forms being polymorphism. The actions have many forms based on the object that you're referencing. Okay, so polymorphism, this is one demonstration of polymorphic behavior. Now, that's all fine and dandy as we're just coding this line by line. But let's do this. In my animal class, I'm going to write a move method. And I'm going to call I'm going to pass one of the child classes to And I just uh, I just paused the video for a second. I had to test uh, test my code out here, figure out the clean way to demonstrate this, and and I've got it. And so what I was trying to demonstrate after I I finished showing that hey we got a parent and it can reference any one of its children, okay, and that's fine, but there's also a benefit where you can take a child a child class and pass it into a reference of one of its parents. And, and that way we're not just working inside of Maine as we are here, but we could take these child objects and then pass them uh, into methods. And so uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write a static method and it's going to be public. It's going to be called info. Now, info is going to accept an animal. And I'll just call it ani for animal, right? So this is inside of the animal class. And we're writing a static method called info that accepts any animal or any one of its children. And all that it's going to do is since animal has a name, in the name field, we're just going to print out the animal's information. Um, in which case, council dot write line any dot name property. So we can write a generic info method that's going to accept an animal or any one of its children and print out the name of that animal. So back over here, when A1 is currently referencing a dog, let's set A1.name equal to Rover, 
And then to call a static method, we say animal dot info a1. And since a1 since a1 is currently referencing the dog, we get the name of Rover. Now, if we had dog d2 dot name equals Cali animal dot info So it doesn't have to be one of those situations where animal is referencing a dog and then referencing a cat. Here I've just got a normal dog. And I pass that dog, I pass D2, into the info method. Because the info method accepts an animal, but dog inherits from animal, this is a valid implicit, meaning automatic, reference conversion. We're converting data types here. We're converting from a dog, then when it passes to this info method, it implicitly converts up the hierarchy to an animal. And if I were to go ahead and start that, you can see it prints out Cali. And as you can imagine, even here, if I change A1 to now reference a cat, A1 dot name equals I have no idea and then we say animal dot info we pass it our reference to a cat you can see now it references CC now just out of curiosity and I you know this is something as you guys go through this you know play with it right but what happens if we comment out CC what happens to our name? I want to see. Because we changed our reference, the name went away. And now there is no name. The, the name for Cali, since it's not referencing a dog anymore, it's not going to repeat Cali as the name. Which I, is what I thought would happen if you change that. Okay? But that's why I wanted to show you, and, and it took me a second, so hopefully you guys had a little patience with me. But that's what an implicit reference conversion is. Implicit reference meaning, hey, here all we have is a regular dog object, dog D2. We give that dog a name. And then we pass that object to a method, that info method, that accepts an animal and then prints out that animal's name. Now, if there was more info about this dog, you could have the dog's age, the gender, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and it could all print out here. You could do the same thing for a cat. That's an implicit reference conversion. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so we talked about polymorphism. And the next section is using the object <laughs> class. So uh, the last section of this um, video lecture, I personally kind of had, when I was studying this, I kind of had an aha moment um, in that it, things started to make sense. Um, because like most of you, like all of you, I would be working in Visual Studio and up here we, we'd have, you know, a dog, this D2 dog. And I'd do stuff like this, D2 dot. And I'd see things like get type. And I knew that's a method. And get hash code and equals and to string. Now, I coded move and I coded name and I coded num legs. But these other ones, equals, hash code, get type, and two string. I was like, where, where did those come from? I didn't code those methods. I didn't code those. Yeah, they're all methods. 
And my aha moment was when I read something in the book. It said something along the lines of every class in automatically inherits from the object class. So there's one class called object that is the great, great, great granddad. It is the top of the hierarchy. And in that class, there are methods like get type to string and equals that all of our classes inherit automatically. So, you know, um, even though dog inherits from animal, when we go to animal, it doesn't say animal inherits from anything, but it does. Animal automatically inherits from object. Whether you type it or not, it's there. As proven by what I did earlier, when I can say a1 dot, and we got all of these methods that we didn't write inside of our animal class. These methods were inherited. Now, what's really interesting about these methods is that these are the common methods that you would expect to find in just about any class. So if you, if you uh, write a class, conventionally, you will override these methods to make them do something. Okay. Now, some of these methods have a good purpose out of the box, so to speak, and sometimes you have to override them. Okay. So just let me um, let me demonstrate because I got this get type method, and so there's really two things. Is it a useful method out of the box, or do we need to override that method to do something more useful? And if we just look at get type, and since uh, you know D2 is our dog, you know. Now, just by looking at the variable name D2, you can't always tell its type. Okay, so that's what get type does. Whoops. It's supposed to tell you the class. And not only does it tell you the class, but it also tells you uh, a little bit about the, the folder structure or the namespace that it's in. And that didn't tell us anything because I didn't write it to the screen, right? So let's do a console write line. Try that again. Okay. So it in fact tells us that this class is dog and the namespace is class demo. So class demo dot dog. That is the type. I would say that that has some usability out of the box. If you had two objects and you didn't know their types and you wanted to see if they were the same type of object, you could use get type. Not from a, not from a, hey, the end user is ever going to see this stuff, but from a, maybe from a troubleshooting standpoint, you need to determine if the classes you're working with are the same class or if they're different classes, you could use get type. So again, not that you would ever use this, I don't think, in production as much as maybe a troubleshooting thing um, or what have you. Now let's take that same D2. And let's put the to string, because again, that's an inherited method that comes from object. <clears throat> and let's see what that prints out. Okay, same thing as the get type. Now, uh, that's. That's not as useful. We already have a method that does that. So conventionally, we typically override toString. <clears throat> and here's 
what we put in the method. Inside of animal, we've got two instance fields, the num legs and the name. And then we've got our properties, methods. OK. Let's override the two string here. That's going to override, well, we could do it for animal. <clears throat> let's do it for uh, let's do it for cat, or actually, since we keep talking about this dog, let's do it for dog. Public does two string returns. Return string. The return string, right? So <clears throat> public string and to string. Now it's going to say you have to return your value. What I'm going to do is I'm going to return the name plus number of legs. And then you get a little warning here. And basically it says, hey, you, you, you didn't add the override keyword. Um, really, the override keyword here just suppresses the warning. It doesn't really change it. it doesn't really change anything. It just makes the warning go away. So we know that we're overriding the two string that is inherited all the way up from from object. So now instead of instead of just returning the the name of the class and the namespace, we're going to return the name of the dog and the number of legs. In which case, our dog is named Callie and has four legs. It's giving me an error saying we can't convert because num legs is an int. Now, now we can use our two string and it gives us relevant information. Now that we've overridden the two string, if we go ahead and run it, we can see that now it returns Cali and four as the name of our dog and the number of legs. So stop and think about this for a second. Oops. So a class has instance fields, and our instance fields are being inherited in this point. And then it has a constructor. OK, uh, everyone, let me get your attention. I, I know a lot of you are, are uh, working on some labs and things like that. What's the purpose of a constructor? When you build an object, what do you typically do in here in your constructor? You set your fields. When you say set, you mean you put data into the fields, right? Yeah. Okay. So so here's our fields. You know, we've got our fields, and granted they're inherited, but all of our classes have fields. When we have a constructor, you put data in. It's pretty simple. You've got data, a constructor puts data in. What do properties do? What does a set block of a property do? What? It sets the field, meaning it puts data in, right? What does a get block of the property do? It reads it. It gets the data out, right? So it's all about working with these fields. The fields, the constructor, you put the data in, the property, you put the data in or you get the data out, then what does toString do? This gets the data out. We're just reading the data out of, out of our fields. I mean, it, if, you, if you can just kind of 
simple, you know, make it simple in your mind like that, right? It's all about working with the fields, whether you're putting data into the fields or getting data out of the fields, or you're going to calculate something and, and, and calculate a field, right? But that's what the purpose of two string is typically. Typically, two string, you're reading data from fields in in this class okay again so it's it's really is it going to be that 100 percent of the time well maybe not but in this class what is a two string going to do two string is going to read data from the fields now these are the properties right but these properties ultimately read data from the fields since we don't have direct access to the field we only have access to the property okay so I just wanted you to you know stop and realize okay constructors data in two string data out properties properties do both they return something and they set something okay now the equals method so the well, I'm gonna step back. Object get type method uh, out of the box implementation is fine. The two string then two string needs to be overridden to give it a specific purpose, which is to read fields. Then the equals method. Well, we're also it also needs to be overridden to determine if two objects are equal. This kind of reminds me of when we talked about sorting and when we talk about sorting objects, and it's like okay, if you sort students. Well, what does that mean? Are you sorting them by their name? Are you sorting them by their student ID? Are you sorting them by their birthday? When you sort objects, you have to determine what that actually means. So when you're determining if two objects are equal, how do you actually, what does that mean? What does it mean if two dogs are equal? Well, we have to override because right now we got we got dog d2 and I, I don't even think we have dog d1 so let's do dog d1 equals new dog just to just to show you this d2 is named Callie and has four legs let's make d1 have the same name and have four legs now if d1 dot equals d2 they are equal this is how you write the equals method you compare the instance to another object one would think Since they have the same name and they have the same number of legs, this would print out they are equal. That's what you would think. However, the default equals method doesn't work how you would think it would work out of the box. It actually compares memory addresses, RAM addresses, and sees if they're equal. Well, since they're two different spots in RAM, this is going to say they aren't equal unless you override the equals method. So let's go into the dog class and let's override public override. It returns true or false. And it's going to accept an object OBJ. This is very similar to 
this looks similar to what you did in the uh, in the comparable right uh, interface. We'll start off by saying, "Hey, yeah, they are equal." Go ahead and create a temp instance of the dog class that's equal to the version that's passed in. We can say if this dot name double equals temp dot name and this dot num legs temp dot num legs so I wrote a simple if else statement if the name is the same and the number of legs is the same. You say it's true, otherwise you set it to false and return is equal. Now the book does a little bit more than that. The book actually goes and compares their types, make sure their classes are the same. Um, but just to keep this one simple, I just compared their, their fields. And if I were to go back to my program and run this now that we overrode the equals method. You can see now the output, they are equal. And just to demonstrate, it would work if, if they weren't equal. If I just change maybe the number of legs, you can see now, whoops, they aren't equal. Okay, so that's it for the demonstration today. We talked about all those different methods that we uh, work with out of the box. Equals, to string, and get type, as well as the object class. And we'll stop this and finish it all up tomorrow.